Thank you so much for the op opportunity to uh, give this presentation regarding patient selection for total artificial heart. I am Francisco Rabia at uh, Banner Health, University of Arizona in Phoenix. Thank you so much again. Uh, this presentation uh, is the result of many years of experience in selecting patients for the total artificial heart, primarily as a bridge to transplant. These are my disclosures. And I imagine that everyone knows how the total artificial heart works now. This it, it is, I will be addressing primarily the Syncardia total artificial heart, which is a pneumatic device biventricular support for patients who are uh, extremely ill. The current use of the total artificial heart has been primarily as a bridge to transplant. And this has been the result of years of using it. The device was initially designed with intention of permanent replacement, but it has evolved as a bridge to transplant. The, it is important to, to keep in mind that heart transplantation continues to be probably the, the, is the gold standard for patients who need uh, total replacement of the heart. It provides the best outcome of any therapy that we have at this time for those patients who qualify. Now, there are a group of patients who are primarily uh, Intermax uh, profile status one and two, that the total artificial heart has been used uh, with uh, very good outcomes. Now, the total artificial heart, as we know it right now, as I said, has been used as bridge to transplant, but that is not the intended use. The intended use is for it to be a permanent replacement of the human heart with the intention of providing total biventricular support for patients who are extremely ill, who are or may not be transplant candidates at one point. And th this is, again, its original intent, why it was designed and it continues to be uh, the future of the device will be for this purpose. Especially now that we have the, the UNOS uh, criteria for listing patients, which promotes the use of temporary devices. So the use of the total artificial heart as a bridge to transplant is for very selective patients. So let me start the presentation by saying who is not a candidate for a total artificial heart. And this comes from a significant amount of experience over several decades in selecting patients and unfortunately turning down patients. And this is what I have learned in the selection process. And as you can see in this picture, you can see sometimes my reaction when I get a call from another center in the US or abroad uh, when, that, when I get told what a potential patient who is being considered for a total artificial heart looks like. And, and, I, and the result of this is because of the poor heart. So let me go over this. Who is not a transplant a patient for a total artificial heart? It's a patient who is in extremis. And by that, I mean someone who is moribund with uh, multiple organ dysfunction or failure in the ICU. Uh, these patients do extremely poor. The device has to be, we have to remember that the device is not a device to resuscitate patients. It is a device to maintain patients. So it should not be, it, it is not the equivalent of ECMO. Uh, and the outcomes are very poor when it's used uh, to resuscitate patients who are taken to the, to the OR on an emergency basis. Another patient who is not a transplant, a, a candidate for a total artificial heart is a patient who is in the ICU waiting for a heart transplant or an ECMO or short-term device who has been there for several weeks who have developed multiple organ failure. And an example of these are patients who have gone into renal dysfunction, are on a, a mechanical ventilation, have developed severe hepatic dysfunction with bilirubin that is uh, increasing and um, in some cases might be infected. Those patients do extremely poor. And we'll go over some criteria to help us decide when is the timing correct for to place a patient on an artificial heart who has been on ECMO? 
Another patient that doesn't do well is the elderly or, elderly or cachectic patients. There is no doubt that these patients do poorly. They just don't have the vitality and the strength to go through a major operation and recover. And one of the cases that I have seen that is in, in an extreme case so that should not be done is when uh, an institution, a family, uh, or a group of physicians are looking at the total artificial heart as the last effort. And if it doesn't work to make the patient DNR, this is quite disturbing uh, when it's, the device has, is used in this method um, because uh, at this point, it's not total heart replacement that the patient needs. They need more like a miracle to get them through. And a total artificial heart is not going to be, it's not the answer. Now, why am I telling you this first, that one of the patients is not, are not candidate for total artificial heart? It is because I'm trying to communicate the poor outcome that these patients have. And we have seen many centers that have very little experience with an artificial heart. They decide to do one of these patients, then the outcome is poor, and the device gets uh, a negative uh, picture of what it can do and then uh, the device is not used anymore and potential patients that could be helped are uh, left without options. So going to the question of who is a candidate for a total artificial heart while they have been on ECMO and this is a question that comes up many many times during discussions and, and is very important uh, because there, there is a, a publication that I participated in many years ago that shows that patients on, on ECMO, and, and I'm giving you the reference there, and this is one of the most important uh, slides in the, in the manuscript, is as follows. If we compare survival of patients on three groups of device of ECMO versus uh, time. This is what we have seen. Patients in the blue line on the top, patients who cross over from ECMO to total artificial heart, who were deemed to be appropriate candidates for transplantation, and that was done within seven days of placing the patient on ECMO, they did very well and survived to an artificial heart and thereafter. The green line, patients who were delayed in crossover more than now. Uh, 10 to 14 days, there was an increased mortality. And the last group in the red line are patients who never cross over to a total artificial heart and remain on ECMO for days. And as you can see, by uh, over 15, 20 days, then the mortality is very high. The survival is very poor. So this serves as a guideline, at least to help us decide when is the timing appropriate for someone who is on ECMO, who appears to be an adequate patient to be briefed to transplantation, who has severe biventricular failure. Now, I know, and I have done patients from this group to LVAT, that we have seen the right ventricle recover in a couple of days, but the left ventricle continues to fail. So, and those patients have done well with an LVAT. But overall, for patients who continue to experience severe biventricular failure while on ECMO, the, and their transplant candidate, the decision to use a total artificial heart has significant value for those patients. So what happens when a total artificial heart is placed in a patient who's not a candidate for transplantation? Well, it's very clear, it's a bad outcome and it's a very expensive bad outcome because it's not only that that patient does not survive, but the cost to the institution and the impression it leaves at the institution is not good. So those, so sometimes they, they stop using the device because they had a negative experience and there will be patients in the future who can be helped who, or are not longer uh, candidates for, to have the device at that institution because the, the experience was so bad that no one really wants to to try it again. So it's something to keep in the back of your mind. 
Now, who's at risk? So we spoke about who are not the patient for our candidates for a total artificial heart. Now, we have been able to identify who are the patients who are at risk for a total artificial heart. And we have found that the cumulative center experience or the volume that they have with the total artificial heart has prognostic indication. For example, we know that at a center that has done 10 or more, 11, at least 11 or more has a better outcome than a center that has done less. Now, is that a requirement? Am I telling you that if you don't have the experience, don't do it? No, that is not. By learning what are the risk factors, any centers can now determine who is an adequate candidate and who is not an adequate candidate. And that's what I'm going to tell you now. And I'm giving you the reference for that uh, manuscript that identified who are the risk factors that a patient will have a good or a bad outcome with a total artificial heart. Older patients, we know that patients, the outcome for total artificial heart up to the age of 40 is very good. Now, after 40, it starts going up and it depends on selecting the right patient for that, op for that operation. If the patient is in renal failure prior to the intervention, prior to placing a total artificial heart, the outcome is poor, generally speaking. Now, if your surgeon performs heart kidney transplant, then you can potentially consider a patient who is on dialysis and gets a total artificial heart for a potential heart kidney. And we have done many of those patients and they have done well. Now, just a word about renal failure and the total artificial heart. We know that if the patient goes into the operation without evidence of renal failure, and a few days after the implantation, they develop renal failure, that patient still has a very good chance of recovery, renal function. If the patient goes in with already renal failure on dialysis, then the outcome is worse unless you can offer a heart kidney to that patient. Patients with low serum albumin, which means patients who are malnourished, have been cachectic, have been in intensive care unit for a long period of time, waiting, those patients uh, don't do well. But that is true for any device, not only for an artificial heart, but is true for LVAT and for any uh, major surgical intervention. The one, the serum total bilirubin appears to be one of those risk factors. When we did the initial analysis of 450 patients in 20, that we published in 2018, it appeared that total bill ruin might have a prognostic value. But as we have done more and more of these devices, we see that a rising bill, bill ruin, total bill ruin that is going up over days and days on a patient on ECMO, for example, or, or on a short-term device, appears to be not a good prognostic value. Now, if the bill ruin goes up, and then it starts coming down and it comes under five units, then those patients appear to be do, to do well. That have, we have not looked at it statistically, but that it appears that that is the case. 